everybody um, to this Meth Connects uh, digital webinar. My name is Tim Green. I'm a technology journalist and the features editor of the Meth. And today I'll be hosting this discussion and we'll be taking a closer look at the blockchain. Uh, before we get into that, um, just a quick word on the MEF. Uh, this is a trade body which was um, founded in 2000 primarily to bring together the entertainment business and the mobile business. Um, and in later years, the E for entertainment changed to an E for ecosystem. And today, the MEF represents over 150 companies all over the world that are exploring the possibilities of bringing together mobile content and mobile commerce. Um, we have active chapters um, in Latin America, Africa, Asia, and EMEA. And in recent years, a key focus for the MET has been the area of digital trust and security. Uh, we've conducted uh, many uh, consumer studies looking into attitudes to trust and identity and security. And we've also published um, a lot of white papers and reports on different models and technologies for tackling these issues. And um, which is a, a handy way to bring us on to the topic of today, um, the blockchain, which is obviously one of the more promising um, models for tackling what is increasingly a bit of a crisis in digital uh, trust. So um, uh, the question is, how, what is blockchain? What the hell is blockchain? And how does it solve these issues? And happily, I have three experts on hand to help us uh, look into that. Um, but before, that, before I introduce them, a bit of housekeeping. First of all, uh, we're going to be recording this session. It's going to be about 50, 55 minutes long. Um, and we'll be promoting the recording and a write-up of this on various MEF channels. So if anyone's watching who's got a colleague that might be interested, um, look out for that. Um, we'll be sharing and um, we, we, um, if, you want to, sorry, if you want to ask a question at any point, um, there's a um, Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. Just click on that. Um, don't wait for the end. You can ask a question at any point. I'll be keeping an eye on that tab and I'll bring your questions into the discussion as you ask them. Um, I think that's it really. Um, I think the toilets are located at the back of the aircraft. Um, you can keep your phones on. Um, so yeah, um, first of all, I'm going to introduce the guys. Rather than get them to introduce themselves, I'll, I'll do it. So um, Peter McCormack with the beard and the tattoos waving his hand. He is uh, a trader, a miner, a blogger, an advisor on all things Bitcoin. He also hosts the podcast, uh, What Bitcoin Did. Um, Elish um, Moan is a um, technology consultant. She doesn't have a beard. Um, she is uh, with part of the PwC uh, Emerging um, Digital Technologies team. And finally, Alistair Johnson is the CEO and founder of Nuggets, a blockchain-based platform designed to tackle digital identity. So first of all, um, before we get into the discussion, it should be interesting to find out your origin stories. And maybe you can just tell me, we'll start with Pete, and he's at the top of the screen. Um, so maybe you can just tell us about how you first became aware of um, the potential of Bitcoin and blockchain. Uh, okay. Um, so my experience with uh, blockchain really is, is more because of crypto. Um, and I had two experiences with Bitcoin in two phases. So the original bull run of 2013, 2014, uh, when Bitcoin quickly went from, I think it was around $200 to $1,200. I was trading CFDs on the um, Plus 500 platform, very quickly made a lot of money. They very quickly lost a lot of money. Um, there used to be a lot of flash crashes back then where you get margin called and... Um, but I was also made aware of it through this website called The Silk Road, which um, was the kind of uh, was the first moment I thought because I'd heard about Bitcoin for a long time. You know, I worked in tech, as you know, and and um, it kept coming up on, on different websites and different forums. So I'd heard about it, but it just didn't make any sense to me. Some made up digital money, and and, and until I realised that you could anonymous at the time we thought anonymously buy things online and and have a certain amount of privacy around transactions. So it was kind of interesting. But my main interest was trading. Then I lost a bunch of money, kind of went out of it again. And then back at the end of 2016, my mum got sick. Uh, we wanted to get her some um, cannabis oil, which is, you know, you can't get in the UK. So I went on Coinbase, bought a Bitcoin, um, bought some cannabis oil for her. And then while I was there, I became aware of this other thing called Ethereum. So, you know, I, I uh, lost my agency. I, I didn't run my agency anymore. So I decided to take a bit, bit of a closer look at uh, cryptocurrencies again, invested a bunch of money, and then 
right because of that became aware that blocked so the gap between 2013 and 2016 was that it wasn't so much just about cryptocurrencies it was actually this blockchain technology behind it could be used for a bunch of other things uh, my real eureka moment uh, for the second time around came when i was buying my miners from bitmain in china i had to do a hundred fifty thousand dollar transaction and I sent that in, I think, like I said, I think it was nine minutes for the confirmation and it cost less than 30 cents. And then since then, any international transaction I can do using crypto, I do. Have you thought about how long that might have taken with conventional means? I, do you know what? I, well, I mean, and you know, cost you, as well. yeah, I mean, you can go to the bank these days. I mean, I got some money out to pay a plumber and yeah, I think it was £2,000 and, and they were asking me what the money was for, which was... It can suddenly start to feel really intrusive when I'm sending money to China and I don't have to answer, answer to anyone. Um, I've got no, I, I honestly wouldn't even know where to start sending money to China, but I imagine it would take a lot longer than nine minutes and cost a lot more than 30 cents. So there's, there's almost no reason to look into it other than if you want a use case. So, Elish, uh, what's your um, Eureka moment around blockchain and Bitcoin? Um, well, yeah, so in 2016, I joined the, the blockchain team at PwC. So um, I'd originally joined PwC, didn't know what team I was going into. And I kind of, you know, watched uh, a few cheesy documentaries on, you know, the evils of technology. And I probably said a lot of things at the beginning that I would maybe cringe at now, you know, um, especially considering, you know, oh, it's the new internet and, you know, things like that. Um, but they were sort of discussing a lot of, you know, the, the proof concepts that they were building out. And then I realized, you know, there's so much more to blockchain than just payments and there's so many other use cases and you know I was just really excited to actually you know start building things. Okay well obviously that's the uh, you know we're going to be coming back to all the various applications of the technology as we as we have a chat. What about you Alistair what's your um, your big moment of, um, of awareness? Yeah I think I was the other way around I was like blockchain first really and it came from uh, a need when uh, at the start of uh, our Nuggets project when we were trying to look for a technology uh, that had zero knowledge storage and we were looking at, at the cloud solutions we were looking at regulated servers in Switzerland and all sorts of things and we really believed that we needed to find a solution that only the user had access, access to and uh, at the time Ethereum was just become, coming out in terms of uh, commercially viable and it, it brought along smart contracts and uh, Turing complete uh, coding language and suddenly it was beyond the uh, 24 on uh, rule set of Bitcoin uh, in terms of that and it was like wow you know, that could be really useful and then through investigation into the technology, we realized it ticked encryption, immutable ledger, trustless principles, consensus, uh, knowledge storage. And it just literally, it was like an epiphany. It was like tick, tick, tick. And then I was like an excitable child then, for weeks afterwards as I went down every avenue and every opportunity and uh, uh, got into it. So we've got a really uh, funny and interesting story. And uh, we, we don't talk about it much publicly because everyone says, oh yeah, I, he was involved in my project. But when we was looking to work with someone who knew uh, blockchain really well in the early days we didn't know really where to start you know we knew a lot of tech people and that were not necessarily blockchain at the time and uh so uh seema the co-founder said oh, i'm gonna email vitalik beauty and, we were, and I, I was in hysterics at the time i was like yeah right you'll have, he'll never respond back to you and bless him 10 minutes later he responded back and said i'll yeah. speak to people in london uh, they'll sort you out and that's how we got to know uh, uh, our first tech people and stuff on the blockchain development. So I, we did try emailing them again about six months ago with another question, but he seemed a little bit more busy than uh, previously. <laughs> right, um, beginner's luck. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, but so, crypto wise, crypto wise, um, it was more um, suppliers and stuff. Uh, yeah. Being obviously uh, working in blockchain for a bit, then having crypto and stuff, and having to pay suppliers around the world, suddenly he was finding out that if you did it for your local bank it was going to cost you uh, seven grand and take seven days uh, and crypto it was going to cost um, 40 cents and seven seconds so uh, at that point it was like an epiphany uh, in terms of the crypto uh, payment side as well so yeah great excellent 
Um, well, obviously, there's going to be, the, 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 you know, there'll be people watching at some point, if not today, at some point later, who, you know, really don't have too much of a clue about blockchain. So I'm sure, Elish, as a, a, a PwC, you've probably got a script um, already for explaining in simple terms what this is, um, using analogies and things. I don't know if you can have a go at that for us. I can, yeah. So, okay. So Good. the two of blockchain as a mechanism of storing and sharing information between many people. So if you think of it like a ledger that's shared where additions are agreed, um, but sort of why you care about that is it allows you know, the decentralization of trust to allow a value flow between intermediaries. So when you really think about that, you know, we naturally don't trust people that we transact with. So uh, to give an analogy around that, you know, say you were to buy a house from someone and they said, listen, I have all of the information in a ledger in the house, you know, on an Excel spreadsheet where I'm saying, you know, a chimney was added on this date or, you know, um, I, the house was built on this date and we did, you know, refurbishments. You wouldn't trust them because, you know, they can change that information. Um, so then we go to a third party to hold that information for us. But then we then have to, they add complexity and then we then have to trust that that third party is going to be truthful with us as well. Um, and then, you know, at the same time, they have a lot of information to deal with. You know, they might have many different versions. You know, you don't know whether you're looking at the most up-to-date version of that as well. Um, so blockchain basically means that everybody has the most up-to-date piece of information. It's distributed, which makes it more robust. I'm probably good. Um, that's probably high level enough, do you think? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously what you've left out there is that those intermediaries, as well as having information that you may or may not trust, they're also going to charge you quite a lot for, for the service that they provide. Very true. Um, so, I mean, you mentioned it being a distributed trust network. What, can you kind of give me an example of how that might work in real life? I mean, I know obviously you've given that hypothetical example of the house, but you must be working with clients already who are using this. Can you give us any examples? Yeah, absolutely. So um, say you were to work in the aerospace industry, for instance, um, you know, you might have a pilot that might want to um, keep, you know, different logs of whenever they um, were doing their flights because that's necessary. Um, so then you also have an airline, say they're trying to hire a pilot and they need to have a certain amount of flying hours as well. You know, that information could be shared with them. And then equally, it could also be shared with a regulator to ensure that the airline is keeping on top of, you know, ha only having pilots that have, you know, um, have worked with a certain amount of, logged a certain amount of hours as well. So everybody's got a shared view. But within that, you can have permissioning. So for example, you might have that only the pilot can put the information on, but maybe the person who was on that flight with the pilot can, you know, sign off that those, they have actually logged those hours yeah. and verify. And then maybe only the regulator can only just view that as well. So you can have set sort of permissioning within that as well. But because everybody has a shared view of the most up-to-date information and that you know that once it's on the ledger, you know, that information will always be there and that everybody is in agreement that information is accurate. You know, it can be trusted without the need of a further um, intermediary. So obviously there's... Um a great deal of interest in this topic. Um, and as Elish has just pointed out, as, you know, people are starting to actually implement um, uh, projects around it. I was watching, I don't know if anyone else was watching the, the France, um, no, sorry, the, uh, the, the game last night, Spain against... Um, it? Yeah. Yes, exactly. So halfway through, there's this ad, curious advert, I don't know if they're Korean, Korean or, or Taiwanese, and it was all about blockchain. And I thought, who the hell um is gonna you know which how many viewers know what blockchain is and even those who do what why advertise around it's like advertising around html or something isn't it so uh, um pete i don't know if i can come to you um you're traveling a lot around the world maybe you can give us an idea of where you know what kind of the state of awareness is around blockchain and whether and, and crypto and whether um people are too kind of uh, eager to talk about the technology um, itself which you know as I, as I just said about HTML no one or pop three or whatever none of these things really matter because they're just in the background 
No, that, that's a funny because I saw that advert and yeah. um, I, I laughed um, because I just I kind of thought it was a bit ridiculous um, because it's kind of like saying um, uh, internet service provider advertising and talking about TCP/IP. Yes, exactly. Uh, it's just it's just not needed. Um, the block the blockchain is just a piece of technology that sits in the background. It, it, you know, users shouldn't and won't care about it what they care about are, are the benefits you know um so i kind of think it's a bit weird i think i think it's a bit buzzword bingo and, and it's kind of so i come at this probably a slightly more negative angle in that um there's a guy called jimmy song who's a, a, a kind of a well-known guy in the crypto bitcoin world who recently said that um most people are thinking they can um solve their problems by sprinkling blockchain magic dust on everything and I think too many people are thinking it's something it isn't. So really a blockchain is an immutable ledger, which is distributed. That's, that's, and essentially um, it is a very poor replacement for a database. And a lot of the examples I've seen of people using it are they use it in the wrong way. Uh, they're trying to decentralize centralized businesses um, and tr create token economies and new, new forms of economies with new monetary tokens behind it. And actually ending up complicating things. The actual proven use case for um, blockchains is very small. Um, I think obviously Bitcoin as a uh, decentralized currency, um, permissionless, trustless, which, um, you know, I've interviewed a guy from Venezuela where people are actually using it to protect their income in hyperinflation is a proven use case. I think what Alistair's doing actually is quite interesting uh, because uh, I use actually it's probably one of your competitor products civic um which is about uh, protecting your identity again it's a very interesting use case but actually what a lot of the chatter now is about far too much money has been raised for far too many of these blockchain projects which aren't truly decentralized would probably be better with an sql database and aren't really going to deliver what people expect could you give an example of a, a an unnecessary um, blockchain inter intervention as it were something that's centralized that doesn't need to be so for example um i don't believe okay so for, sometimes there's um halfway houses so something like filecoin or seer coin um which wants to use um unused hard storage space to do uh, for distributed storage itself is a good idea but building these with their own token and economy is, um, is a red herring and will create a number of problems for users. So what tends to come with these blockchain solutions is a token um, or some kind of uh, exchange of value. And what's happening is people are replacing uh, fiat money, you know, paying for services with your credit or debit card with some kind of monetary token. So Filecoin, you will pay for storage space with the file coin. And if you're holding storage space, you will be rewarded with file coin. Same with Seer coin and such. Mm -hmm. um, the problem these have is that um, unless there's a staking mechanism, there is a price risk by holding the token. So that there itself is creating problems with using the blockchain. Alistair might know a bit more about this as well. Um, other things you just tend to see uh, if you go on something like ICO Bench, you'll see lots of different blockchain and decentralized projects. And you know the the common uh, one we hear is oh, a decentralized Uber. Um, the problem you have with most of these blockchain-based projects, if they're going to be truly decentralized, they're not going to be on a private blockchain. They're going to be on the public blockchain like Ethereum or EOS. The problem is these blockchains can't scale even to support. Uh, small projects. So there's one called Crypto Kitties, which allows you to hold uh, a digital asset on the on the blockchain and buy and trade. That essentially grounds or halt the Ethereum network at some points, which is one application. If you imagine Ethereum is trying to scale to tens of thousands of applications doing millions of transactions a second, we're probably years away from that being even possible. Therefore, the blockchain or any kind of application which has any pressing need for throughput of transactions is probably going to fail. Whereas I actually think 
the the blockchain can be used for things whereby I think one of the very, very interesting um, areas is uh, ownership of um, uh, equity or issuance of stock on the blockchain because it just becomes a more efficient system. Um, I, I am going to come to you, Alistair, because um, what your offer your offering is is going to be very fascinating to to meth members i know that um but before i just want to pick up something else on what pete said so you're um if we can just sort of uh, take it back to basics a little bit more you talked about public and private blockchains and about um uh, uh some of the companies that are offering that can you can you uh, distinguish between the public and a private blockchain for us um so uh, uh so a public um blockchain is something like ethereum um it's a uh, it's, it's a um it's a blockchain that anyone can build an application on top of okay a private blockchain is one which is is, is run privately which tends to be less decentralized and it's something it's funny i even put something on twitter the other day i am tr i'm struggling to find an application for a public blockchain uh, sorry private blockchain which would be better than an SQL database. I'm struggling to see where the trade-off is. There are always different levels of centralization and decentralization, but I struggle to see where, where it is. But this is not to be an entirely negative. I, one thing I, I think, I think, you know, like with the dot-com bubble, everybody pushed to, you know, ran to create uh, e-commerce businesses and a huge amount of money was invested in e-commerce operations, probably ahead of consumer adoption, even though the idea was right. I don't think anyone realized the golden goose of um, the, dot, the dot com era was going to be search and social. And I think quite possibly at the moment with crypto and blockchain as such, still don't think we know what the golden goose is. And, and because our grandfather and our flagship uh, blockchain project is Bitcoin, which is the decentralization of something that was originally centralized, I think a lot of people are believing that therefore everything else needs to be decentralized when actually i think the opportunities um, and where business will go will be to build centralized applications on top of a decentralized network and a great example of that is coinbase coinbase is hugely successful mm. i assume it's worth over a billion now um, it, it is arguably a bank it shares a lot of the characteristics of a bank it into it, inter, um, it interfaces with blockchains but itself is a centralized application that's built on top of the crypto blockchain world. So Alistair, I would imagine that you think the golden goose is identity. Um, so maybe you, you can, maybe you can explain a little bit about um, what the problem, uh, what the problem uh, is in the digital identity space that you are solving and how you're using blockchain to solve it. Um, well, our thing is really, it's uh, identities at the core of it, but it's about ownership and control of that information. Literally, uh, Nuggets as a concept came from my, my uh, credit card details uh, being taken and used fraudulently. Somewhere I plugged it in online. So uh, I'd obviously put it in a website or a service. And uh, we always use the analogy that you wouldn't write down your credit card number, your mother's maiden name, your first uh, pet's name and your email address and then stick it on a post-it note and stick it in the, the till at the shop around the corner. But in a digital sense, we are, we're, we're doing that all over the internet because when I had my details used fraudulently and I get a bit of plastic back and I need to plug in all the details, firstly, I was like, oh my God, I've got to do it in so many sites. I've got like 50 locations where I've left my credit card. How crazy am I? And then you combine that with all those uh, breaches that are going on out in society, you know, uh, you know, the big ones we've seen uh, in terms of Facebook, Equifax, and things like that. And then you realize that even these companies with these large budgets, um, it, it, with all the best will in the world, been unable to uh, protect that information. So our premise was actually about uh, tied to identity, but to give back ownership and control of that information but in, uh, back to the individual. So it was like zero knowledge storage principle in terms of they're the only key holder to access that information and I think identity in itself is a brilliant it's often seen as a great use case our principle is uh, 
Peter mentioned uh, uh, another brand earlier and how that works. But sometimes that actually passes information. What we're trying to do is not pass information when you interact. So you use a digital identity, but you prevent uh, actually passing uh, information to services, if at all possible, including your credit card, your email, you know, your login and user details or, or anything like that. And to keep it as a minimum, uh, in terms of that. So I think identity is at the core of it, but it's how you associate identity to other services and products because having your passport uh, uh, in an identity on the blockchain, but not being able to interact with any services or validate it uh, sort of invalidates that whole identity experience. And then there's the, the ability of having the attestation of uh, uh, someone saying that that is a good passport and then passing that token of that attestation as proof and the value of that, then it becomes a lot more stronger. And then being able to use it to do a payment transaction to a traveling document uh, like flights or something like that, and then be able to walk through the airport and associate that. And in our case, we've, we've associated it to biometrics because there's too many username and passwords around and we think they're a weak point. We feel email and SMS verification is also a weak point. So we're trying to keep it to that digital identity at all points. And the other one, I got it again today, and I keep saying I get it every week, and now I'm getting it every day. But one of the things that we're trying to do is, you know when uh, you get the phone call off your bank and they go, oh, it's the fraud department. Can I have your mother's maiden name, your first pet's name, and such like, and all these details. And you, you, at that point, you go, well, yeah, but can you prove that you're my bank? And they go, oh, I can't do that until I've got all your information. And at that point, I'm like, this, this stops here. I'm not doing it. So part of our product, again, is that identity, but not only proving from our side, but also the merchant side or the service side that they can prove to you that you are, and then you can verify back with your biometrics. And we've even had uh, people come up to us when we've done talks and stuff where, like, help the aged, or I think it may have Age UK or something it's evolved to now, where they said they've got problems with people uh, knocking on the door and they don't know if it's really the gas man and should we let them in and that. And they were saying it'd be great if we could use your product where they could verify on the other side that they are from that uh, company. Because we're also looking at that you can't transact without the identity on the network being proven from both sides. It's, it's no good you just having it and then going to a service, but the merchant can't prove that they're the real merchant. Otherwise, yeah. you'll go to a phishing site. And it'll be the same as plugging in your details like you can now and off goes your credit card details. So what we found was important that there's consensus and proof uh, of good actors on the network, both in terms of merchant and uh, uh, the individual and uh, the ability uh, to prove that uh, cryptographically uh, that they are trusted parties on the network and that there's a reference and a record of trust trusted activities behind that identity is where the real power of identity then grows for us. So, I mean, that's uh, the direction. So it's not just identity in its own right. I think it's uh, the components that come together uh, make the whole greater than the sum of the parts. So. And you, obviously your um, original vision is that Nuggets would be a kind of custodian of that and would be the, 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 the party in the middle um, but at some point you realized that blockchain was a better way of managing that because that way you don't even see or touch the data. Is, yeah. is that correct? Did you come to that realization later on? Or? Yeah, well, it was literally, we were trying to find that zero knowledge uh, uh, storage principle with mm -hmm. different methods. And if you do AWS, someone uh, uh, can go in at a root level and access your information. If you look, look at like Dropbox and you lose your username and password, someone can go into that. And we actually re realized that the key to it was having it where only the user has access. So Nuggets as a whole is actually only an enabler, not a holder of the information. We have no access to go in and get that information back for you. Uh, but we're enabling a platform where you can do it in. And obviously that's then transferable as well. We actually build it in an agnostic manner. So the, the assets are actually encrypted inside the encryption of a blockchain. And then they can be uh, actually evolve onto other blockchains if they become faster and more appropriate and so on and so forth. So that, that's been our sort of principle from uh, day one. It's, it's really about having, uh, realizing, we're not knowing the technology, but realizing that the user has to be the owner and controller of that information. But in, a, in an easy format, as, as my experience with consumers is, it's, it's gotta be easy 
uh, in the first instance to be able to do it. And that's what that, so how do you bring them into the, in, uh, how do you bring uh, consumers and merchants into your universe, given that um, obviously the benefits are obvious, but you know, at the, if nobody's using the system, then yeah, it's it's interesting. Kind of exit thing, isn't it? Yeah, a lot of people say, oh, you've got to get this enormous network effect first. But actually, when we're talking to brands and partners, they're not the only ones who approach us in terms of that. And they then go, well, actually, you tick all my problems at the moment. I've got login, I've got monthly payments, I've got uh, communications with customer services and things like that. So actually, you're resolving all these problems. And I've got deliveries of thousand pound phones and things like that. And I need to know it's got to the right person and so on and so forth. So what they very quickly realized that it actually resolves their problems in the here and now. And then the beneficiary of that is their customers because then they incentivize their customers and go, well, if you use this, it'll make, it'll give us massive benefits. It'll stop uh, card fraud, which is good for both sides, uh, uh, fraudulent chargebacks where customers say, oh, I never got the shoes and then force the card company to pay the money back uh, to the customer and things like that. And our, that cost obviously goes back to everyone in terms of that. And also the big one that a lot of people don't realize from the consumer side is false positives. So the point where you go to use your credit card uh, in a foreign country or when you jump off the plane and it says not today, the risk assessment says not. So what we're, what we're doing in terms of that is we're adding every time you do a transaction, we put a little uh, good flag transaction on that in a transparent manner. Now we don't say what you spent or how you spent it, but put a little flag on to say it was a good transaction. That builds up over time, so you've got thousands of good transactions. In future, when you go to uh, purchase something, you don't need that risk assessment that currently happens every time. And then beyond that, you don't need to get a credit reference for a new car or a large value item. So that's where the true potential of that consensus, that trustless network really goes then because you'll be carrying around this digital identity, cryptographic proof that you're a good actor on the network and that you're good at doing transactions. And then if you apply that on the merchant side and then behind the merchants, the staff that interact with the merchant also proven into the system as well. And then it becomes a lot stronger in its principles. Just one more quick question for you, Alistair. Um, you mentioned about um, the, the users um, uh, you have to use biometrics. Mm -hmm. um, does that, uh, what about people who don't have biometric devices? And also what about the possibility of having your biometric stamp stolen from you? Uh, well, firstly, the biometrics the way we use it, we keep it on the device and it's uh, kept in a secure enclave. So, and we use that as well. So it's frictionless for consumers. We've actually done tests actually. And you find that as soon as bi uh, consumers see a biometric prompt, they go for it often without reading what was above that. So we actually have to separate it up a bit. So at the moment there is methods uh, um, uh, with fuzzy extractors in terms of uh, uh, enabling biometrics on the blockchain. Uh, but it's, uh, it's not really uh, uh, fully evolved that. But a lot of people who do third-party biometrics are still putting it in centralized servers. And that's a high risk because if that centralized server with all that biometric information gets breached, you're going to have to change your fingers and your face. Now, in my case, a new face might help, but not everyone will uh, want that. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a tricky thing uh, to go about. So you have to be really careful. So at the moment, uh, the principle is to keep it uh, device uh, centric and we're associating the private key to that biometric uh, access at that point. But in future, I really do believe that the, 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 the device will just be an interface. In future, you'll go into services and you'll use your biometrics uh, actually on the service. You know, instead of touching the yellow pad in the tube, you'll put your thumb on it. Or as we were saying earlier today, you might have to lick it, but that might be a bit inappropriate um, after a while on the tube. But um, uh, basically, I really do believe that uh, as all these things evolve on, on from being like on a computer, a laptop to now a mobile device, I think in future, you're, you will be that proving point of all those assets behind you. Uh, and it won't be as dependent on the mobile phone and that, but it needs to go a little bit further down the road before that can happen. So um, let's sort of get into the practical side of things. Elish, you're, you're talking to a lot of corporate clients at PwC and advising them to try uh, to do tests on the blockchain or, or whatever, or launch live services. What, what's the actual practical process? I mean, Peter talked about um, private and, and public blockchains, about Ethereum and so on. 
Um, what, what's the, what are the basic steps involved in actually um, setting up a blockchain-based project? Well, so we start off with a design thinking workshop at the beginning. So we usually do have, I know a lot of people have kind of mentioned, you know, where people do want to just slap a blockchain on something, you know, where it's sort of, um, you know, there is quite a lot of hype around it and it does sort of make your company come across as being quite innovative if you are exploring blockchain. So sometimes we do get people sort of go, um, I would like a blockchain solution. And you're like, but what's your problem? So we kind of then would, <laughs> would go out and try to explore, you know, potential blockchain use cases, starting with what are the main, like what's your process and what are the main pain points you know, within that process and actually getting people on the ground to kind of discuss that. And, you know, we do have a blockchain criteria as well. So, you know, we have six set criteria to see if, like, and if it doesn't meet four out of six of those, we straight away go, okay, a blockchain solution isn't for you. So let's explore some more maybe traditional product engineering approach to this. Or it might be that they tick four out of six and it's still not a suitable solution. So you still have to further explore. So we would look into, you know, do multiple parties share data? Do multiple parties update data? Is there a requirement for verification? Um, do intermediaries add extra complexity? Are interactions time sensitive? Do transactions interact with each other? And then on top of that, you know, because there are many parties, you know, as sort of discussed, you have to ensure that all of those parties are going to mutually benefit from this. Because, you know, if only your client is going to benefit from it and you require other parties to get on board, you know, it's not going to work either. So you kind of, um, you know, it's all about the case of making sure that it's a suitable solution before you build anything, you know. Um, after that, you know, we would start off, we would usually begin with, you know, a proof of concept sometime between sort of six to 12 weeks. So we would kind of have, you know, a sprint zero at the beginning where we would kind of work out, you know, what's the, you know, what is it that we're trying to achieve here? Um, what are the key features involved and prioritizing those, you know, in case we don't meet them all. And then at the end of two weeks, she would kind of have, you know, it's the whole agile approach, you know, where you have the demo at the end of two, mm -hmm. two weeks, you get the constant feedback. So once you've got um, the proof of concept, then you would possibly go into um, a prototype. So a proof of concept is kind of a throwaway thing um, where you're just proving out the concept. Um, a, a prototype would be more towards um, you know, making it, how would this actually really work alongside your systems and kind of future-proofing it so that if you are moving it towards pilot, you can use that. Um, then we would go into the pilot, you know, which is your minimal sort of amount of features going forward. And then hopefully into production. We don't have anything to production yet, but we are planning on doing so. So Pete, you've got a good sort of um, bird's eye view of, of the options available to anyone who wants to build some kind of smart contract system or, or just, you know, distributed ledger based um, system. What, what, what are the options and where can they, you know, where can they go? They can go to Ethereum, they can go to well, Ripple or... Um, I, mean, I would say right now the, the only place you would be building um, a smart, using smart contracts is probably on Ethereum. Mm -hmm. EOS is just launched, but it's having a few problems. It's much more centralized than um, Ethereum, so you wouldn't be, you probably wouldn't use that. Um, uh, Neo has similar kind of issues. Uh, Cardano's coming, which proposes to be something quite incredible. Um, I think right now you probably, although some people argue you can build smart contracts on Bitcoin, um, but um, the only place you probably would be building smart contracts is on. Um, uh, Ethereum, and then it, it depends what those smart contracts are for. Um, I, I've still, I've still not, I still worry about smart contracts, and I worry about um, their usefulness on an immutable ledger. Um, so the parity, um, um, uh, the parity wallets uh, froze uh, something like 110 million in uh, funds. So there's still issues with smart contracts um, and not fully knowing what they will and won't do. Uh, I think it's fine on a decentralized exchange, moving small amounts of Ethereum around, but I'm still unsure whether the, I think we're still in the very early test cases for smart contracts and I don't really think many companies sh should be looking at it. You have crypto companies out there who are already testing out the software, seeing what's happening, trying things out and finding the problems. There's a lot of active debates. You just have to go on Twitter, follow anyone in the crypto world, and you can see there's very active debates 
uh, for and against smart contracts. Um, some people write some oracles saying they're the next big thing for financial institutions. Other people saying they're deeply flawed. So I don't believe that they uh, smart contracts on Ethereum are anything that the corporate world needs to be worrying about or thinking about just yet. I don't think. I mean, explain why what the arguments are that, that says that they're deeply flawed because you know the the propaganda would would tell you that. Um, a smart contract takes a lot of intermediaries out the out of the equation and um, is just more efficient and more transparent and um, you know obviously that that's it, we're in the early stage of the hype cycle so a lot of the commentary is is positive again it depends when you look at it again I, I talked about Jimmy song earlier he wrote a very interesting piece about smart contracts where he essentially the smart contracts can eliminate uh, act like act like the judge it's a uh, rigid structured set of rules that explains a scenario where a when a happens by point b then point c happens and it's a rigid structure therefore replaces any uh judiciary requirements because the smart contract itself is the judge but that itself is a flawed process because it doesn't allow for any flexibility in certain scenarios so if, if you took, um, I don't know, smart contract into the world of um, eBay. At point A, when I deliver my couch to Alistair, um, I will be paid X back to myself. But say in the point in the future, something to do with that, no, so a car would be a better opportunity. Say uh, the car is delivered on time and the smart contract pays out, um, and then about three weeks later, there's a problem with the car that wasn't foreseen and actually was Alistair's fault and was hidden information. Then we're still going to have a judicial process for that smart contract. Also, in the, the, these smart contracts, um, whilst they can use escrow, they, they still operate on a immutable ledger. And immutable ledgers are really not very good for the business world. The business world likes the ability to um, change things, discuss things, argue things, go to court and, 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 uh, um, and debate things endlessly. An immutable ledger is, can't be changed. Um, yeah, again, it's a big discussion in the world of Ethereum at the moment with the parity, I think actually, sorry, the parity wallet freeze might have been $250 million based on yeah, whatever went wrong there. Now, the, there is a debate at the moment that nobody's lost, it, it doesn't harm anyone to um, fork the Ethereum network to release those funds back to those who've lost them because nobody has those funds, they've just purely frozen. But at that point, the, if, you, if you fork it, therefore it's not an immutable ledger, therefore code is not law, therefore it sets the precedent. Mm. So whilst these smart contracts sound great, I don't think for the general business world that they are yet proven to be something that will serve a purpose uh, um, with an immutable ledger. But that's my point. Uh, uh, plenty of other people will argue, yes, no time we'll have escrow and, and other services which will um, you know, arbitrate when there's issues. But I just, I don't see the benefit as yet. Well, uh, that argument I'm sure will go on uh, because as I said, we are, you know, I think we're very much seeing the positive side of that mostly in the media at the moment. Alistair, when, when talking about, um, the options for you know which blockchain you choose, as it were, when you uh, when you set up Nuggets, what, how did you decide sort of which, if, if such a question makes sense, which blockchain to use? Yeah, well, I, I think at the point uh, where we were looking at the technology uh, before that, there was uh, Bitcoin uh, uh, in terms of that, and there was principles of uh, coloured coins and such like, uh, but it was somewhat limited, and Bitcoin did very well what it was designed for. Uh, in terms of that and the potential with uh, Ethereum was uh, like I said Turing complete uh, and the smart contract uh, opportunities as well so at the time that was really the only player now I've seen, I've seen a lot of uh, suggestions as Pete was saying of uh, uh, magic uh, blockchains coming out uh, that will resolve a lot of those problems in terms of transaction rates uh, and so on and then even when you look at ethereum this talk of sharding uh, and uh, 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 
uh, proof of stake instead of proof of work to speed up transactions. So everyone's um, moving along and evolving and we're all seeing how those developments are. But yeah, at the time when we came to it, it there wasn't a lot of options really. Uh, so it was uh, the Ford Fiesta or nothing, really. Uh, and then over time, the Ford Fiesta's got some nice uh, spoilers and some new wheels on it, and it's evolving. And uh, hopefully it'll be kitted out as a rally uh, Ford Fiesta further down the track. Uh, but, yeah, there wasn't a lot of options in the early days. Yeah. And when, um, if and when sort of blockchain goes, blockchain goes mainstream, um, I don't think this is a question anyone can answer, but... You know, at the moment, let's say 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you, people were talking about the internet. No one really knew what it was. Now, if you want a website, you can go to GoDaddy, and you can register your site and you can go to uh, an ISP and, you know, it's, it's, you can do sort of um, uh, templated sites. It's all quite easy. You can drop, drop in, you can go to Shopify and start a shop. Uh, you know, it's kind of like, it's quite easy to, to get all, everything up and running. If we move to a situation where a lot of transactions are going through a blockchain, what what might that future look like um, in terms of you know how you set things up and how things are just made easy and you don't have to worry about acronyms or anything like that? Probably depends what part you're using. Um, if you're accepting cryptocurrencies as a form of payment or to use payment, likely you will plug in um, services into what is your infrastructure you already have. Um, in terms of um, whether you require a blockchain for a part of your business, I think that I, I don't see blockchains. I doubt will be something like um, Shopify, where some home business or small business yeah. wants something to build themselves. Uh, um, probably you won't ever require your own blockchain. You might interact with blockchains through some kind of plug plug-in service. I can't really see a world where people. But then again, that's what Shopify is. Shopify is you don't create a database, it's all done for you. So I think the majority of people will probably interact with that without realizing. Like most people who build a WordPress website or Shopify probably don't really understand the database schema, how, whether it's cloud hosted, how it works. And I think probably it'll be the same with uh, blockchain. If people, are, if people are using it, they probably won't realize. And I think that's actually a good point is uh, you want to know what are the benefits, what are the problems it's solving. And uh, yes, uh, you, the business may be reinsured and other principles are reassured by that. But at the end of the day, it's like, as it solve the problem? And, uh, you know, if it's a relevant component in solving that problem, then that's great. And if it can solve more problems that we've had in the past that couldn't have been solved, then even better. But yeah, I, I think it's... It, it, very much on the consumer side, it's, it, it, it doesn't need to be that involved. Then they just have to see that they can do something maybe that we couldn't do yesterday or have better reassurances or better security or whatever they couldn't have done. And, and that's the true benefit that uh, comes to the consumer. You don't need to, like you say, you don't go around going, oh, which shop uh, e-commerce store am I going? Is it going to be a PHP one or you know, uh, C plus or whatever, you, uh, you, you just go, this is resolving these problems. So I think, and it's interesting because there's the whole blockchain protocols and platforms. And someone asked me uh, in China recently said, Where, what do you think is going to win the, the protocols or the platform? They go, well, you've got to have the protocols to have the platforms on top of it. But if you look at the in internet at the end of the day it ended up very much more of a platform and application thing it becomes uh, the, the greater variety comes from the interface point with people at the end of the day and until we're all uh, robots it's going to be how you interact with those people and maybe the blockchain is going to cause that problem that we will all be robots but <laughs> we'll have to see what's exciting for me about the blockchain is that at this point it's a little bit like the early days of the internet where it was just plain text on a, a plain background. And it's almost like we're at that stage of it now. And we probably can't even envisage where it's going to be in five or 10 years time. What we do know though, the cycles are getting shorter. 
and they're getting more accelerated whereas it probably took 20 years for the internet to really establish itself and like be doing all your banking and everything else on it it probably came earlier than that but uh, nowadays it's probably going to be five years uh, we'll see an evolution and then the next one will be two years and then the next one it may be artificial intelligence is writing all the code for us so it might be even one year and so on and so forth and then the next we may be all sat on the beach twiddling our thumbs but we've yet to see so Elish, what do you think what, do, what how would you um uh view the speed of adoption given that you're um sort of talking to a lot of different sectors I don't, well, I would say that there still is quite a lot of hype around it. Yeah. At the same time, you know, like it is still relatively immature. So, you know, even if you, you know, we were talking about the fabric star, like the, that current architecture is going to evolve, um, you know, even within the next few months, I would say. Um, you know, the, it, that kind of evolution, it's true for most technologies. So even though it's quite mature at the minute and there's a lot of heavy experimentation for it um i would say that it is going to constantly improve and joe as mentioned before like i was in a meeting with a client and joe, there was going to be um you know a blockchain layer in their application and joe, they were asking and what's it going to look like like what's it going to look like for the end user like it's just going to you're going to have your standard sort of ui you know you're not going to realize that there is you know that blockchain is working its magic underneath you know, so I, I do think it's going to be more prevalent than, you know, than we're going to know and that a lot of end users are going to not even realize that there is a blockchain in their application whatsoever. Yeah, I think it's that film in principle in filmmaking where when you don't realize uh, uh, it's good special effects are special effects. You know what I mean? That'll be really when blockchains landed is when we're all using it uh, to order a pint or uh, pick up a car. Uh, or some service like that and it, it may well be blockchain behind it and and that's when it'll be going to overdrive i think um we've only got a few minutes left and we and and obviously there's the sub the topic of, of of today is is blockchain and and sort of security and, and and trust and so on but um i think given that we've got pete with us we have to ask a little bit about um crypto and bitcoin uh just what obviously that's that's had a roller coaster in the last few months what what's your long term i'm i'm sure this is the first time you've ever been asked this question pete but what's your long term assessment of of where bitcoin's going um so it's been volatile for 9 years it's had probably like six of these kind of spikes but they they get more dramatic because the numbers are bigger you know $20,000 is kind of insane um so uh, i i i like uh Two things about it. I, I love the technology. I think it's incredible. I think it's a, a, amazing that there is now the ability to create wealth and monetary uh, unit, units of money outside of government control. There's no, you know, the government's no longer have a monopoly on uh, wealth creation, which is cool. Um, for it to become a useful monetary unit outside of um, basket case country cases like Venezuela and Zimbabwe with hyperinflation, it needs some form of price stability. It's not going to come until we have much higher levels of liquidity. Um, but what I'm really excited about this. So the thing I really like about Bitcoin, crypto and blockchain is there is now this interconnected global pool of liquidity, global pool of money that can just move around the world at an instant. And the area I am quite excited about is uh, the way it can provide funding for projects. So a lot of these ICOs that we hear a lot about, most of them are nonsense, most of them will fail, a bit like the early dot com, um, because they're, they're not great ideas. But there's this sad belief that an ICO needs to be a decentralized project or a cryptocurrency project, which it doesn't. An ICO could be run with an, uh, an equity token, like a subcategory of a security, whereby anybody investing, they're essentially the token represents um, a ownership of stock within the business. The great thing, there's so many benefits to that in that um, you have this global uh, network of people you can um, raise funds for. So just, just say you have a startup idea. It can be anything. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't even have to be technology. You could create an ICO, you could raise the money uh, in crypto, you could issue a token which represents ownership in the company. 
And anyone who knows who's been out there and tries to raise funding from, um, from uh, venture capital knows it's an arduous process. You have to go to getting meetings is hard. It's a hustle on the phone. Going to the meetings is hard work. Presenting your pitch deck, you know, it can take months. Whereas you can now create a website, run an ICO, present your pitch deck online, and you can raise uh, 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 money from this global liquidity pool yeah, really quite quickly. And also, you don't have to rely on a number of big checks. You know, you got a guy in you know, Vietnam who can invest $100 into your startup. So it creates a much level playing field for investors outside of, sadly, the US who have their SEC uh, accredited investor rules, which are you know, very archaic. Almost anybody can be a VC. Anyone can invest, and they can invest from this global pool of liquidity. So I think there's a really good opportunity for the building of centralized concepts and ideas on top of this decentralized pool of liquidity mm. to create a much fairer and much uh, a much fairer and um, how do I put it a much fairer and interesting way of raising and moving capital around the world. And Alastair, have you looked at uh, ICO to raise money? Yeah, we actually. Uh, uh, a, a utility uh, coin in terms of doing that and the thing that excites me most about it is to Pete's point is that it, it, I believe there'll be an innovation spike around this uh, point not only just because of blockchain and stuff like that but suddenly it's not down to the banks or the big business to decide on what's a good project and a good idea a community of people around the world and literally around the world excluding uh, regulated areas can partake and say i think that's a good idea i can contribute to that and i really do think there will be a um, a spike uh, in innovation off the back of that because before that it was whether the the big vcs decided it was going to happen or not or the bank decided it was going to happen or the businesses are going to decide and now it's people saying actually i want that so i can help influence that and uh, and that is what's really exciting about it really in terms of that community principle and that's where the money will go so what you'll find is you know again i, I always refer to the dot com i like it as a comparison because um you do have this bubble and bubbles aren't you know, people talk about bubbles like they're a bad thing bubbles aren't a, a bad thing they're just bad for people who come at the wrong point with poor investments and lose money. But actually bubbles are build around innovation and uh, wealth creation opportunities. So they bring capital in the market and they essentially accelerate the innovation in technology. What we're gonna find over the next year or two is as these uh, crypto companies and decentralized projects and ICOs start bringing products to the market, we're gonna see if anyone cares. We're going to see where there's traction, where there isn't traction, and where they can build businesses. And what will happen is those ideas that work will stand out, and that's where capital will flow towards. You'll get similar products, uh, projects, and ideas. So after MySpace and Friendster proved social network is interesting, we got Facebook, we got Twitter, we got Snapchat, you know, we got Instagram. Um, similar, you know, we had a whole bunch of search companies at one point. Once a model is proven, you will get multiple companies start to appear in that space. And then what we will do, what we will start to build are, are categories of um, uh, crypto blockchain based businesses where we know there is a benefit to users and, and there is a benefit with the technology. Excellent. Well, letting the market decide seems like a very good prescription for this. Um, and um, I thank you all for, um, for taking part today. I thank Peter, Elish and Alistair. I thank everybody for watching. Um, just a reminder, we did record this and we will be sharing it. So if you look on the, the MEF Twitter channel, Facebook, uh, uh, the, the blog, um, you'll be able to see, uh, follow up, watch it again and um, pass it on to your colleagues. So uh, again, thanks very much for watching. Thank you again to our participants and we'll see you on the next one. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.